So last Monday at 8 o'clock in the morning, I was invited to go up to Harlem to be in this beautiful meeting of actors and activists and authors and poets and protesters, all of us to work on peacemaking. I did say it was 8 o'clock in the morning, and I had to be in Harlem by 8 o'clock in the morning. So I got up, brushed my teeth, put my clothes on. I just couldn't even bear to try to beat any face. It was just too early. Um, and I thought, when I get to the bathroom at, at the uh, Interfaith Center near Riverside Church, I'll know what to do. Went in the bathroom, pulled up my little powder, got my little red lipstick out, ready to be ready for the day. And the door opens and another woman comes in, also needing to do the face-beating project. Um, she comes, she stands next to me, she's beautiful. Uh, curly hair, beautiful skin, and uh, we just do the thing girls do in the bathroom, which is you always pick somebody up in the bathroom. Hey, girl, ooh, I like your shoes. How you doing, you know? Um, how long did it take you to get here? 14 cabs, we just did the whole thing. And I said, what's your name? Maya, my name's Maya. Great, my name's Jackie, where are you from? I'm from New York, where are you from? Hawaii, great, that's great. And you're here for the same peacemaking thing? She said, yeah, I'm here for the peacemaking thing. Fantastic, that's great. I go sit in the uh, uh, meeting room and on the program it says, Maya is the guest speaker. Like, oh, good for me to not know that <laughs> with my unprepared self. And then as the morning goes on, it's like someone says, one day you'll be as famous as your brother for your peacemaking. I'm like, uh, duh, this is Obama's sister, Maya. This is, this is, oh, this is, this is, I just wasn't ready. This is, and we're all, mm-hmm, girl, you look good. Oh, you're so beautiful. You too, hug, hug, kiss, kiss. Lovely surprise for it to be Maya um, Sotoro Ng, who shares a mama with Obama. Stanley Ann Dunham, who happens to be, have been a good friend of Susan and Claudius. Anyway, I was kind of blown away, not on her bio, not anywhere in any of the materials did she claim the Obama relationship. And she didn't claim it in her speaking. She was so super humble and so super beautiful. I wrote down a million things she said, but the thing that struck me the most was this expression she used about how we need to wash the eyes. She said, our job as peacemakers is to wash the eyes. It's a, an Indonesian expression, kuchi mata, wash the eyes. She says it might not change the way you look, but it'll change the way you see. It'll change the way you see. I think our text today is meant to wash our eyes. Um, many of us grew up in all kinds of different places, all kinds of different churches or not churches. But what leaks into our culture are these theologies of money. Somebody whispered in your ear that, um, you know, if you simply make a tithe, everything like magic that you've ever prayed for or wanted will manifest itself. Or, or this is my favorite, if you make a seed offering, when the offering plate goes around for the fifth or sixth time, the way that that seed offering is going to work is you're going to have a blessing. Hallelujah. And the car you've been wanting is going to magically happen. Or, or the people who are poor are maybe poor because of the sins of their mothers and fathers. And it's a punishment for something that happened in the past. Or, or maybe someone whispered this in your ear. If you'll just pray the prayer of Jabaz, your territory will be magically increased. And the blinking one will tell you, God just loves you and wants you to have everything. It's just yours to have. Just pray it and it'll come. You know what I'm talking about? Worse is the scriptures itself sometimes misused to teach us that the poor will always have with us. And if we're going to have, 
if we're, Jesus said, the poor we're going to always have with us. So why do we need to do anything about the poor people? Those theologies criminalize and demonize and otherwise poor people and make us somehow feel like they're poor because they're not doing the best they can or they didn't try hard enough or they didn't pull them up, themselves up by their bootstraps. They just, they're just lazy. They're just poor. And then we listen to this text and the best of us, the nicest of us, the most decent of us, someplace in the little pocket of our heart are like, what? Say what now? The, the, what, wait, the people that came at 5 o'clock got paid the same as the people that started at 6 o'clock in the morning? Oh, no. Is that fair? Is that right? The people at noon got paid the same? Oh, we might even say it ourselves. Oh, hell no. That's not, that's not fair. I don't, that doesn't make any sense to me. Because we are so used to the rules of the kingdom of this world and have not yet stretched ourselves fully into the kingdom of our God and of our Christ. Jesus says, God is this kind of revolutionary lover, this kind of justice maker that believes that everyone, everyone should have enough. In fact, the text says everyone should have the same. That means no matter who they love, no matter how they look, no matter how they make a living, no matter when they got to the table, no matter if they showed up last or first, everyone should get the blessing. And man, that just doesn't, doesn't go with the Protestant work ethic, which where we grew up. Work hard, work hard, work really hard, and it's yours. And all those other people, they just need to work harder too. Flannery O'Connor wrote a beautiful, wild short story called Revelation. And in the story, there's a woman named Ruby Turpin, a prissy, southern, fluffy woman who believes that she understands the categories to which everyone should be um, cast. So she sits around in the doctor's office. She's brought her husband, Claude, to get a checkup. And she looks around the office and she's like, yeah, that one's, mm, that one's kind of white trashy. Or, mm, that one's not quite white trash, but that one's just common. She has this whole hierarchy in her mind of the people uh, in, in her town where she and her husband are you know, land-owning homeowners. So they're here, and above them are the people who have bigger homes and more land, and below them are the people who just have houses. And way down on the bottom are poor white people and poor black people. And she thinks that's how God designed it. So she's having this conversation in the doctor's office about this hierarchy, and there's a girl named Mary Grace, a kind of acne-prone teenage girl reading a book called Human Development, she listens, she listens, she starts to boil, and pretty soon she takes that book and she flings it across the room and hits Miss Ruby Turpin in the head. <laughs> then she climbs over there and jumps on her and starts choking her. <laughs> and then she calls her some kind of bad name and like that. I'm not a proponent of violence. <laughs> but I think it's pretty true that Ruby got her eyes washed <laughs> when that book <laughs> came flying across the room. She leaves that, that violent encounter and goes home and kind of has a vision of all these people going to heaven. And in the vision, the people at the head of the heaven line are poor people and black people. Everybody Ruby thinks should be on the bottom. Uh, I don't think Ruby's the only one who struggles with the way things should be. I think many of us struggle with should. Maybe, maybe not quite to the extreme of casting folks down and up. But we wonder, is it fair if that person gets the thing and I didn't get the thing? Or should they get the blessing if I didn't get the blessing? We can be pretty stingy uh, about blessings. We're left disquieted by the way God loves the world and loves the people that we don't quite love. 
we struggle in our that's not fair space for God to lavishly pour out love and blessings on those who've not worked as hard as we, who've not belonged as long as we have, who we perceive to be late to the table or late to the party or not having enough wisdom or not having enough faith or not having enough something. Brown people, poor people, female people, people in addiction, people struggling. We just think, well, maybe that's how it's supposed to be. But like that dying thief on the cross next to Jesus who recognizes what God is up to, his blessing is instantaneous and immediate and unearned. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. So there's no place in the Gospel of Matthew that says the word grace, but clearly that's what this text is about. It is about the unmerited, unearned, can't work hard enough to get it, ridiculously, lavishly, crazy love of God that shines on all of us equally no matter what. We can't buy it. We didn't earn it. It just is a gift. And it is also this text about God's wacko, winko, turned upside down kingdom rules where the first will be last and the last will be first. In her collected letters, uh, Ms. O'Connor writes, all of human nature vigorously resists grace because grace changes us and change is painful. We resist grace because grace changes us and change is painful. I think that's right. I think we've been changed by grace, though, middle family. Not always comfortable. You know, to be honest, somebody comes in and they're a little stank stank. You're not excited about them sitting next to you, right? You guys are looking like, I don't want to admit that. You know. <laughs> but you, but you, but you scooch over and let them sit. Amen? That's what you do, middle family. You're not always comfortable with the edgy people who come to get the food over there and then take the food and stick it in their stuff and stick it in there and take it home. Come on. You're not comfortable. But you don't wrestle them to the ground. And you understand that we offer that food because for some people in our congregation, that's the only food that they're going to have that day. Amen? We're being stretched. We're being transformed. We're being pushed and shoved to be the body of Christ, to be the people of God, to live with the mind of God, to have our eyes washed with the vision of God. So we may have entertained those other theologies when we were young, we know. We know what time it is. We're outgrowing that prosperity stuff. We're not, we're not expecting that to be real anymore. We know that those things are not valid, that those theologies don't work. And we also know, we also know that we have to work. We have to work with God on behalf of God to manifest God's economy. That's what we're talking about, God's economy right here on earth. So what do we do? Um, we middle with our budget every year, with our ministry every year, we make a $77,000 grant to the Momentum Project. You do that, a $77,000 grant to a program that feeds hungry people on Monday, like no matter what. They come, hot meal, good food, and once a month they get to take a, take a bag of groceries home. You do that. You do that, middle family. You host the Emokali workers, who are a coalition of people who grow tomatoes on their farms. And they have made new rules about tomato growing for all of the fast food industry, except Wendy's, who's resisting. Even Walmart got on board. But you, you can't get tomatoes uh, unless they're fair trade, uh, fair food program tomatoes. And this is a coalition we're hosting to make sure that we have fair wages paid to those tomato folks. We host the Tenement Empowerment Conference yesterday. Over 100 people here to work not just as housing being a civil right or a human right, but a divine right. You're doing that as well. We're connected to the MICA table, who's making sure that the people of New York get a real living wage, because $15 ain't gonna cut it here in New York, right? 
And we're working with Lower East Side Ready Coalition to be a drop-off site for all of those who are suffering from Hurricane Maria's crazy wild winds. We're working with the Closed Rikers Group right here, right now, to dismantle the prison industrial complex that makes black and brown people especially, but all kinds of poor people wear housing in jails as a way to have an economy working. That ain't going to work for us. Amen? If we're honest, texts like the one we read today make us go a little squeamish about what's fair and what's not. But the God who loves us loves them. The God who loves us loves them. That man laying in the cardboard box on the street when we come to church on Sunday morning. That woman who needs safety nets like welfare, women, infants, and children, those young actors and actresses who do not have health care if we strip it away. Our God wants to wash our eyes and help us to see the world as full of loving human beings who need, deserve, must have the same blessings, the same right to life, the same quality of life as all of us. The first will be last. The last will be first. In God's economy, everyone, everyone should have enough. May it be so.